Good morning, everyone. Okay. So, what is it to be human? Not in the biological sense of the word, but in the larger context. What is humanity? What is the price that you are willing to pay for your humanity? <laughs> it's an easy, nice little light question, huh? Hmm. This is something that's been on my mind for the past few months now. I've uh, been asking myself this question because, as you probably know, I'm working on the winter musical, Cabaret. And the deeper I go into that story, in the history behind it, the more I'm asked to look at our society and question our and my own humanity. For me, art reveals truth. So I'm going to bounce back and forth between reality and illusion, between art and life. I'll try to be clear when I make the transitions, but sometimes it's not a well-defined line, so I hope you'll give me a few minutes of your time and your focus so I can try to explain what I mean. Now, unfortunately, it's going to be very difficult to fully express my thoughts because words can only articulate so much. And in fact, for me, they're a very poor means of expressing my thoughts and my feelings. So bear with me. I'll try to do my best to make this something that's worthy of your time. I want to start by looking at art. In just over a week, we're going to open the show Cabaret. It's a fascinating piece. We, it's been done in theater and schools all over the world. And there's a reason it's considered a seminal work of American musical theater. Uh, we've done that show here uh, at Brooks twice before. And yet, when I mentioned that this would be the choice for the musical, there are people that question this choice. Some for political reasons, some for moral reasons, and some for personal reasons. And all of these people, for, for them, those reasons were real and true. I was told that doing such a provocative show might make some people uncomfortable. It's entertaining, but it's not fluffy. And at times, it can be quite dark. You see, it's set in Berlin, Germany, on the eve of the Nazi Party's rise to power and the start of the Second World War. Some of the people in the story are cabaret performers, Jewish shopkeepers, and foreigners. All the people that would have been rounded up and exterminated by the Nazis in places like Auschwitz or Dachau. This is the backdrop for the story. A world where society shifted from the culturally free to the nationally oppressed. What made this happen? Well, it's, it's complex and it's multifaceted, and you'll probably be glad to hear that it's a discussion better for history class than for now. But now, we live in a different society. 2017 America is not 1937 Germany. Yet, as I look at the world that we live in, I see our society wrestling with some of the same complex issues. I see great beauty, much of it in the form of human spirit. But I also see much anger and hatred, all of it directed at our fellow humans. Now, how can these completely opposite and contradictory realities exist or coexist? Now, I know I'm being oversimplistic and I'm being abstract, so let me pull into some specifics. When I started writing this talk right around winter break, international terrorism and national hate crimes had spiked. In the US, backlash against minorities based on color, sex, sexual orientation, religion, nationality, and cognitive ability had jumped according to the FBI. In 2015, hate crimes with a gender identity bias jumped 15% from the previous year and over 300% from the year before. Some who've committed or condoned these crimes have called it the new normal. I personally refuse to believe that. For my faith in humanity is much deeper than my belief that humans are inherently malicious. But looking at it begs a question. Why exactly is it that some people are targets for hate? 
what is it like to be on the outside of what society expects? Even if those expectations are not stated, or even if they're verbally discouraged or discounted, what is it like to be black, or a girl, or gay, or a Muslim, or an immigrant, or different? I'll never know. But wrapped within this question is a paradox. Because we're all different. So why is it that some of these differences are acceptable to some of us, while others are not? As human beings, I can't escape the fact that I am biased. And so are you. It's, it's the dark side of humanity. But much of my bias, I try to confront and learn and grow from. But then, there are those things that I don't even realize that I react to. So let's zoom in a little more and explore how this is reflected in art. Cabaret looks at them, the others, as some would say, the morally compromised, the broken ones, who for reasons which may or may not be within their control, have ended up in the cabaret living lives that force them to act in ways that are both demoralizing and dehumanizing. They're completely different from you and from me, and yet, in some ways, they are exactly the same. Maybe not in how the differences are manifested, but in the fact that, at times, there is something that makes them feel or believe that they are on the outside of society. Some of them and some of us mask that very well. And some, not so much. But the underlying truth, the undeniable human truth, is that they are all unique individuals. And they and we are bound together by the very existence. The gifts that they have may be the same as yours, but their burdens are heavier. However, I don't know. I don't know your burdens. I want to take a look at a song. The song is called I Don't Care Much, and it's from the show. And it tells how we convince ourselves, or try to convince ourselves, that we don't care, or that we don't hurt, and that this is what we call mask and cover. And it's how you and I and all of us keep going. So I'd like to take a look at that.
I might as well just end the speech now. This is, you know. um, in the show, Cabaret, Lulu masks her pain by selling her body, Max by asserting dominance, Sally by escaping onto the stage. That's all they have access to. How do you keep going? How do you mask? Hopefully it's through much healthier outlets than the characters in the play. How do we see cabaret going beyond self and connecting to what we see in society? To answer this, we need to go back a few steps. Theater has always been a place where ideas are shared. Some of those ideas serve to support our own beliefs, while others push us to grapple with realities we may choose to ignore or want not to believe. Either way, it's the act of sharing, of sparking a conversation where theater found its beginnings. In the time of the ancient Greeks, where modern Western theater was born, playwrights were expected to consistently to be consistently critical of social and politi political status quo. As we move from the Greeks to the Romans and into the Dark Ages, theater became more divided. One branch pushed towards entertainment, one pushed towards propaganda, and another stayed true to the idea of social enlightenment. By the time we got into the 1400s, theater was all but banned throughout much of Europe because it was believed to contain messages that sparked provocative thought and uh, threatened control of the church. This tension felt all throughout history is still with us today. When we read about someone engaging the company of Hamilton during a performance, we could just as well have been reading about Bertolt Brecht in pre-war pre Germany and the reaction to his work, which purposefully engaged the audience by the German political elite. There's a reason that totalitarian regimes, when they rise to power, one of the first things they strip from society is the arts. So why is it that this thing that we see on stage sparks so much reaction? I believe it's because it makes us see and feel and think in ways that we cannot escape. Unlike this chapel speech, you choose to go see a show. And once you're there, you laugh, you cry, but you think. For it's not solely the actions on the stage that move us. We're, we're all aware that the people that we see on the stage are our friends, our classmates, our students. They're, they're our community. But even with this cerebral knowledge, we still let ourselves believe, and that's powerful. It's the ideas that we are forced to confront that inspire or enrage us. It is the critical thought that moves from the abstract to the human. We see an idea and we feel it in a way that cannot be done by me standing up here talking to you. Now, I'm telling you all this because like the ancient Greeks, I'm compelled to question what I see in society. And as a teacher, I'm obligated to ask you to do the same. I want to look at the show through two very specific Brooks lenses. The first, empathy. I'm asking you to see the characters, not the actors, but the characters on the stage as the people they are. I want you to allow yourself to be taken on a journey, to connect to and to feel with and for them the second way I want you to view the production is through a very critical lens. I want you to look at the sets, the blocking, the choice of casting, and I want you to ask, why? Don't be a passive audience. Don't sit there and let the show wash over you. Instead, engage, like you're doing now. Engage with it, and let it give you more than what's on the surface. <laughs> now, at this point, I need to talk a little bit about what's on the surface. Um, in this production, there's a large amount of sexuality, drugs, and what some would consider other taboo subjects. I'm obliged to let you know this, because if you're at a point in your life, and you very well may be, where you cannot get past these issues, you will not see the reasons that they are in the script. Yes, there are sexy, whatever that word means, dancers in the cabaret. And yes, 
They use their sexuality to get what they need to survive. Survival, the most basic of human instincts. However, if all you can see is the showgirl, you will completely miss the broken soul that lives within that body. This show, as with many great works of art, lives on two planes. It entertains and it enlightens. Set yourself up so you're able to experience both. One of the other things that you will quickly notice is that we've made a choice to ignore most of the gender indicators in the show. Women play men, men play women, and they all play this diverse area in between these two binaries. We've not changed any of the names or any of the pronouns, because for me, it's not about the sex of the character. It's about the soul of the person. In Berlin, during the mid-1930s, when the play is set, the Cultural Revolution ran directly into the national movement, the result of which was the rise of the Nazi party and the cleaning up or exportation of minority groups. These people, seen as outside the norm, were first restricted to the ghettos and then to the concentration camps. In the mid-1960s, when the play was first produced, America was experiencing a huge cultural shift. It was coming out of the 50s, and things that were perceived and considered as social establishments were being questioned. The Civil Rights Movement, the National Organization for Women, and other entities pushed against the status quo. The very idea of open discussions on topics such as drugs or sex was seen as a threat by many. And yet today, the 60s are seen as a cultural revolution. Jumping ahead to the first major Broadway revival in the 1980s, there was another new topic that society was grappling with, homosexuality. Homosexuality was coming into the mainstream and just starting to become accepted by, as a social norm. But just as with similar topics 20 years earlier, it was a subject that many felt would lead to the downfall of American morality. Today, you can hear the exact same comments made about things that, such as gender identity or gender expression. It's in the papers. It's, it's in the courts. And if you're able to zoom out, it's a repetition of a historical humanitarian theme. So why do such a politically charged play? <laughs> in truth, I'm not too terribly interested in the politics of the piece. Politics are a reflection of society. And it's the universal humani humanity that I find so powerful. The irony is, when I chose this play as the musical, I was fully expecting Hillary Clinton to be the first female president of the United States. The choice was not political. Hmm. That choice would have been way too easy and it would have let us off the hook. Please understand, I don't want to use this chapel talk or the show to tell you what to think, but instead just to ask you to think. So I want to end where I began. I'm going to ask you a question. What is it to be human? Is it, like the cabaret dancers, just to survive? Or is there more? Is it to help our fellow humans so we can all do better, so we can all thrive? For me, being human is the never-ending quest to find that shared humanity that connects us all despite and because of our glorious differences. I refuse to believe people are only seeking their own self-interest. Ask any parent. Look at your own parent or caregiver, and I hope you'll see that that's not the case. Being human is to give. So, what will you give? How will you make this thing that we all share, this gift that we call humanity better for being a part of it. What is your humanity? Thank you.